struck again, this time rather than going to Cadenceville uh, and destroying draft files, uh, they went to King of Prussia up the road here in Pennsylvania. Uh, eight of them um, went into uh, this uh, General Electric plant and hammered on a, uh, a missile nose cone that you would put over a nuclear missile. Little did I know I would wind up in Baltimore, we'll get from Pepperoni went swatted to uh, Baltimore, Maryland. But uh, <coughs> uh, I, I don't think this is shocking information. If you get involved with Phil Berrigan, uh, somebody might be watching you. Uh, Phil Berrigan did six plowshares. That was the one I mentioned was the first. I was in Africa. I was with him on the other five. And I don't know if the statute of limitations is. Uh, <laughs> Well, Mr. Goldstone, my attorney here, <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, we all read uh, The Puzzle Palace by James Bamford. James Bamford wrote three books on the National Security Agency. And in the first book he wrote, Puzzle Palace, he talks about the only demonstration that ever took place at the NSA was the Jonah House, where they poured eight gallons of blood. This was during the, the Vietnam War. And uh, eventually, the Baltimore Sun, back in the day when it uh, did um, much more expansive reporting, uh, did some stories about the National Security Agency. So Phil and others said, hey, it's right in our backyard. We got to go back. Uh, we uh, went to Washington, DC, and talked to uh, Tom Baldwin. Some of you might know that he's now with the National Public Radio. He's the Pentagon reporter. Would you care to join us on an expedition out to the National Security Agency? And he declined. But he put us on to an, another reporter. And if you ever pick up the July 5th, 1996 Baltimore Sun, a uh, terrible article by this gentleman who they brought down from Philadelphia. If there's any homicide fans in, in the room, he's represented uh, as a corrupt reporter in homicide. And this particular guy eventually was bounced because he was plagiarized. It was really a terrible article. Barrington and his crew can't get arrested at the NSA was the title of the article. Because Phil, myself, and some of you know Jeremy Scale, um, we, we blocked the gate there, but they chose not to arrest us that particular day. But I'm sure they set off some alarm bells. And um, coming to um, Puzzle tell us, moving over to Body of Secrets, Bamford's second book on the NSA, we happen to be in it. It's the, the Vault of Emergency Response Network and uh, Fletcher Resistance, and so we're in there. And sure enough, he indicates in there that they produced these action reports and also put us in this like terrorist uh, category. Uh, so this is, this is, this is, we're talking 96, 97, when we started going back out to the NSA. That time I was working for the American Friends Service Committee. So we're planning to go out July 4th, 1996. This is the second demonstration ever at the NSA. And I get a phone call. And it's a gentleman saying uh, uh, he would like to know more about the, the demonstration. He claimed to be Nate Pitts of the Baltimore Sun. Well, I knew Nate Pitts, and I knew this guy wasn't Nate Pitts. <laughs> And uh, he's asking, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I can send you a press release. Why don't you give me your, your fax number? And he didn't know the fax number. <laughs> I, uh, I, assumed, I assumed he was with the National Security Agency. I had been asked, why don't we meet for lunch, et cetera, et cetera. And later, when Bamford's book comes out, I find out he was with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And then he calls me in 1997. So uh, we were on the radar screen. And not getting into all the details, but we could tell we were being watched. And I'll just give you this example. Um, <coughs> I used to work for the American Friends Service Committee. If anybody's been to the one in 
Baltimore and Brick Road. It's now been sold, downsized, um, sold to Loyola University. But right across the street is a post office. And the Baltimore Intelligence Squad used to go in the second floor of the post office to observe us. So we're gathering, taking license plate numbers down, telling the people out of the NSA when we're going to arrive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, five of us got arrested in October of 2002 out of the NSA. Just, we just, we, we sent a letter, asked for a meeting to talk about criminal activity and safety in place, and then go out there, because we never get a response to the letter, and they arrest us. So this particular year, and I told you I worked for the American Friends Service Committee, so um, I was the person that would uh, be in contact with the prosecutor, and we're in the Fort Meade docket, which means these are military prosecutors. And he calls me, he says, Max, we're dropping the charges for you and two others, but uh, Cindy Barbar and Marilyn Carla were proceeding with the case. We all did the same thing, but they dropped the charges against three of us. And in that particular case, Cindy was acting as a pro se uh, lawyer. And I was a witness in the case, so I couldn't go into the courtroom. But I know all the NSA security officers, and this one guy who's going to testify. He comes that day, he brings this loosely mine that's about the size of Manhattan phone book. And I noticed, and, and, and Mark would tell you, uh, that prosecution presents the case first. So he goes in. And then he comes back out, and I'm in the witness area, just still observing, and he takes some papers from, from this, this document this big and takes it into court. And I didn't know what was going on until later I found out. And then he brought more, you know, he came down and said to me. And actually, he brought into court through discovery, he, he gave us the documents that confirmed that we were being spied on. There were, there were two actions. He made a mistake because he gave of that demonstration that we were on trial for. He also gave an earlier one, and so the action report talks about you know, we are uh, we are terrorists and how they're going to deal with us, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this so the trial was August twenty second, twenty third of two o three. So we then approached the um, American Civil Liberties Union, and it was not easy to get them to take the case, to say the least. But it, it, again, I won't get into all the detail, but eventually they did take the case. And um, this was 06 now. And they got a high-powered law firm in, uh, in Washington, D.C. to do all of the grunt work, filing all these uh, FOIA requests and also Maryland uh, information requests. And I was on trial in D.C. Uh, for the ghost of the Iraq War, 10 of us uh, stood up in, in Congress in, in, the, in the gallery of the Senate, and we put hoods on, and we said, we are ghosts of Iraq war. We don't want any more people to die in, in uh, Iraq. Uh, Ted Kennedy happened to be, there, was, there it wasn't the full Senate, but it was, there were five or six people of a particular committee, including Ben Cardin, who was the one that gathered us, you know, Sergeant Lawrence had us arrested. But they were meeting, that's the last time I saw Ted Kennedy, because eventually he got the brain tumor later in time. So we were on trial now for this case, and when I got back to Baltimore, there was a message and an email from David Roca of the ACLU, bingo, we have something. And it was the Maryland State Police. They said, we have one page, we have one page, but you can't have it because there's an informant's name in the page. And so the ACLU went into court. And as it turned out, there were many, 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 again, this is a long story, there's many, many, many more pages than one page. And initially, it was thought that I was the only person that was you know, uh, in, this, in this database. Um, but it soon came out that there were actually at least 53. We know there were 53, it might even be more. And initially, when you know, we're going through a process of getting this information from, from the uh, uh, Maryland State Police, um, Everything was redacted. This, this is from Maria Allwine. Some of you know Maria Allwine. This particular group was, was the Maryland Coalition to Stop the Raid Height was one of the terrorist groups in the database. <laughs> now, I have, I have a similar document. This is the initial document that we got from the Maryland State Police. It was the same size, it was blown up. Everything was redacted on the page except for the last sentence down there. Everything was redacted. 
And through a long, long, long process, eventually the ACLU got, got, got all of the documents without redactions. Uh, so Maria, well, she was asking this question. I should show you this side. I've been spied on in these three groups. Which, why did this enter into my being laid off from my job? Pledge of resistance, the Maryland Green Party, the Maryland Coalition of South Great Eggs. Pledge of Resistance would meet at the American Friends Service Committee in Lucy. The, the informant from the Maryland State Police would come to our meetings. And one thing I got to give her credit for, she did very good note taking. Very good note taking. <laughs> so we've got a lot of records now because of Lucy. <laughs> now, some of us were just in, in Hyattsville with busboys and poets celebrating the death of the death penalty. And I mentioned it, like, it was one of the people that gave me you know, a couple, uh, couple uh, minutes of what was happening with the death penalty. The last time I saw Lucy, we did a march from the death house to the state house. And uh, that's the last time I saw Lucy. She was outside. She never came in because the appeals court was hearing one of the arguments on the death penalty. And she, uh, she had her laptop. And I had no idea what she was taking down that day. But eventually, she got a lot of information to us indirectly. Uh, and one thing I mentioned to the people at the, uh, at the busboys and poets, once we got the documents, we find out that she approached me after a death penalty rally in Baltimore, right near, with, uh, near the execution chamber. And uh, once we got the unredacted files, we found out that uh, there was somebody else listening to the conversation. So we were assuming this particular person was in a van or something, and she was wearing a wire. And she was basically saying to me, don't you want to get involved in the group, and, you know, involved in the death penalty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that, that's uh, a little bit about it. I'm hoping through questions and answers to uh, share more about it. But uh, at this time, I would argue, I would argue that uh, <laughs> This is something we have to deal with. This is something we have to deal with. So uh, hopefully through questions and answers, we can figure out uh, what we can do about possibly bringing back the Constitution. We have an expert here who's probably going to tell us how to do it. Thanks, Max. <laughs>